Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Alice Meadows. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Support for ORCID. Um, my talk is not going to be at all technical, really, um, but it is going to be a kind of plea for you to, um, if you're not already doing so, uh, use ORCID um, in your publication workflows and to do so in a way that meets the needs of the community. So I just wanted to start by having a quick show of hands who's already on a version of OJS 3.0 or higher. Great. Well, those of you that are, um, the good news is that you can do a bunch of this stuff already. Uh, if you're not, then I guess my message to you is please consider upgrading when you can. Ah. Okay, I think we can probably all agree that names are messy. This is the reason why ORCID and other persistent identifiers exist. Names can be, the same names can be used for different things, different... Uh, things can have the same names. Uh, names cause a lot of mess, basically. And that's why we have persistent identifiers, whether they're for people, as on the left-hand side, or for places, organisations in the middle, or for things. And I'm sure these are all um, identifiers that you're quite familiar with. As I say, I'm going to talk about ORCID primarily today, but we couldn't work without these other sorts of identifiers. So this is our vision. Um, I think the things to pull out about it are the fact that we're inclusive. We're not just for uh, researchers working in academia, for example. We're not just for uh, researchers who write articles, in fact. We're about for anybody who's contributing to research in any way. Uh, we're a, an identifier, obviously, so we're about identification. But really critically, it's not just the unique identification that's important, but it's the ability of a persistent identifier to connect with other identifiers that, that, that makes it powerful. And then, again, what makes us persistent, we, we, we are persistent across time, disciplines and borders. So your ORCID ID, your author's ORCID ID really is um, their sort of digital uh, online name, if you like. A little bit about ORCID, I um, expect that many of you are at least somewhat familiar with us already, but we're an open and non-profit organisation, we're community-led and community-run. Um, we provide researchers with their ORCID ID, and it is an ORCID ID, I know people hate it because it's like ATM machine or PIN number, but uh, we act as an adjective as well as a, as well as a noun, um, and that's what's used to, to connect people with their works and affiliations and so on. And we have around 550 um, ORCID integrations live. Uh, about 100 to 150 are using our public API, non-member integrations, and the rest, including OJS, are member integrations. So this is really a sort of high-level look at what, we, what our ideal world is, if you like. This is our kind of vision. So this, this idea of interoperability where persistent identifiers, including ORCID IDs, are collected and connected with each other and can flow around the whole um, sort of scholarly communications uh, ecosystem. So the researcher is in the middle, and whether you're their employer or their funder or their publisher, you're collecting their ID and then connecting their work, for example, as a publisher back to them. So how are we going to go about making this dream a reality? Because it's not completely a reality at the moment. It's somewhat aspirational, but we are making good progress. So this is, this is the sort of publishing version, or one publishing version of making our dream a reality, where a, a, a researcher can use his or her ORCID ID at every stage of the publishing process and have the information about their publication connected back to their, to their record seamlessly. And this is actually all happening now. So um, not on every um, platform, but um, Editorial Manager already has single sign-in with ORCID for well over 3,500 journals on their platform. So that's something that you can definitely do. Um, ORCID auto-update, auto you may already be familiar with. This is what enables researchers to use their ORCID ID when they submit um, a paper and then give Crossref or Datacite the permission to connect that information, the DOI, back to their ORCID record on publication. Um, that's had quite good take up. Uh, those numbers listed are for 2016. Um, we're ex we, there's obviously many more at this point. This is how it works. So from an organisational perspective, from your perspective as a publisher, the key thing is that we want you to collect authenticated IDs, and that's why being on OJS 3.0 or, or a higher um, uh, uh, version is really important because those are the only versions that you can collect the authenticated IDs. So this involves your author going in and claiming his or her ID within the ORCID registry, not just um, uh, keying it in or copying it in. That ID then gets included in the metadata that's sent to Crossref or Datacite. Um, it's displayed in um, the published article so that people can see that it was used and that it was done so that was done so in an authenticated way. 
And as I say, cross referral data site can then connect that ID, uh, connect that, um, the DOI for that work back to the ID um, automatically. The researcher just has to give permission once. And then for anybody, oh, my time is up. For anybody that's a premium member, you can get automatic updates. This is how it works for researchers, pretty much the same. Just make sure they're authenticating and authorizing cross ref. And um, this is just my plea to please, we need you. Everything on the left, you do not have to be a, an ORCID member to achieve. On the right, you do to connect, to connect and synchronize, you do. But everything on the left, you can do without being an ORCID member, and we strongly encourage you to. Thank you. All right, so I'd like to thank all of our speakers and invite them to come up to the stage where they can answer questions. And I'd like to ask if you have a question for one of our speakers that you please line up to use the mics uh, so that everyone can hear us. All right, does anyone have a question for any of our speakers? Do any of our speakers have any questions they might like to ask any of our other panelists? All right. Just tying together Alice Meadows and Mike Mason, uh, do dead people have orchids? Well, sort of yes and no. Um, <laughs> officially, the answer is no. You, you can't assign an ORCID ID to a, to a dead person because researcher control is at the heart of what we do and you can't clearly sign up for an ORCID ID if you're dead. However, there are dead people with ORCID IDs who signed up for them when they were alive. <laughs> I think that's authoritative. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> there is, there's more on our website if you, on, in our... Um, uh, uh, um, principles and guidelines if you were interested. A uh, question about the versioning in OJS3 that's being uh, planned. Um, what capacity is there to have summary around um, what the difference is between the different versions? Or is, that, is that captured in some way? Nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, <laughs> but you can add that if you want. It's okay, so you just see you're saying that you just see the the versions and you see the the dates and the the different uh, aspects yes. of that. Okay, good. thank you. But a good idea. It's also on the the list if you want to do it. Like we need more things on the list, but yeah, the list that's is great. longer great, than this. Great work being done with that. So but yeah, there are great. More, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Mostly this is going to sound like a fan shout out for the versioning, um, but as you were saying that I was thinking how exciting this would be for some of our uh, political scientists who are working on legislation, particularly international legislation, and being able to track um, the scholarly work that goes around that kind of um, versioning of a treaty or that kind of thing. So thanks very much and yes, we will be in touch. Thank you. Does it actually, it does work, okay. Uh, a different response to dead people have orchids, or can dead people have orchids, would be if you say, they do now, and then you walk someone through the setup process, and then you shoot them. <laughs> so, like, there you go. I'm amazed I didn't think of that answer. <laughs> Um, on the question of orchids, how do you deal with disputed authorship? Uh, it doesn't happen.
them a huge amount, but we do have a dis dispute process. So um, if people, it, basically, uh, as I said, we're a community-led initiative, so we don't ourselves go in and check everything. We couldn't possibly do that, and we don't pretend to do that. But if somebody alerts us to a disputed authorship, we will take it up with the individuals involved and their publishers, if necessary. Um, and it's, well, I've been with ORCID for over two years, and I think we've only had two or three you know, somewhat significant cases where that's been the case, and in all cases it's been resolved um, fairly quickly and easily. So it's, it's, at least from our perspective, it's not been a big issue at the moment, but we do have a process in place to deal with it. I suppose, what I'm, uh, since I deal a lot with dead authors, uh, what I'm, uh, and with dead authors we very often have problems of disputed authorship, and they're often uh, uns insoluble. And uh, is there any way for, uh, is, is there any sort of tagging whereby a, uh, a user could discover that, this, um, if there, that there is a question about the, the authorship of this or that article? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I guess the hope is that because auth um, ORCID IDs can only be um, self-assigned, can only be claimed by a live author, um, that any disputes would mostly be... I can't believe I'm having this conversation, well, I'm sorry. Exa exa um, exactly what be, I'm afraid of is your live author uh, claiming, uh, claiming something that a dead author would also claim, but he can't do it. But no, they can't, they can't do it because, um, because you'd have, you have to make the connection between the... the live author's ORCID ID and the work mm -hmm. in order for that connection to be there. So mm -hmm. you, you, can't, you, you can't claim a work as a dead author. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I really, really, really didn't think I was going to have as many questions <laughs> about this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah uh, thanks, Mike, for the, for the presentation. I thought that was uh, right on point. We deal with that all the time. And it, extends way beyond metadata. Uh, a big thing is the transition from OJS2 to OJS3 and removing the banner image and, and people's tendency to chuck text into the image and then to explain to people this text cannot be read when you're looking at it on a phone, you know, all those kinds of things. I'm just wondering if you have any idea about, I mean, obviously there's a lot of strategies, some technical, some social around solving this problem, but do you have any thoughts about how we like build awareness around that distinction between what you see and, and, and what's actually in the data and how to get that understanding sort of more widely understood. And Yeah, I think there's options for um, promotion or literacy around what metadata is for. I just think that it's sort of a losing battle. So sometimes I have these conversations with faculty members at my own institution about the utility of good metadata, uh, where they store their research, what they do with their research. And I think that they, they get it, but they don't have, they don't have time to care. Um, but I think there's opportunities. We had an excellent um, conversation with some folks at uh, uh, Crossref um, on the first day of the sprint about you know using say schematron results that would say things like uh, you know titles written in all caps maybe don't. Um, and I think if we can find ways to sort of integrate that feedback into the experience of writing the metadata in OJS, actually get responses for people, so managing editors or, or copy editors who are doing the work uh, can review metadata and get and get feedback in a in a real sensible way instead of a giant you know, JSON result that they don't understand, uh, it might make things a little bit more user-friendly for them. And I think most of the hurdles that we've run into are just that those tools don't really exist right now, um, but they can, and how we integrate those into the software in a meaningful way uh, so that people don't constantly face, you know, XML results uh, that just say the word failure a bunch of times, or they just assume there's an error because they got an email with a bunch of XML in it and they don't know what that means. Um, so uh, basically just making plain language results for people that they understand. Um, yeah, I think promotion and, and encouraging people in those directions. You know, we, you did excellent work in the in the you know having help tools and, and the dialogue and the com the, the actual um, like in inline help that goes a long way. But obviously, you're not going to write here are all the ways you shouldn't write a title or uh, please don't put you know your phone number in a title or you know there's only so much we can control. So, do do you feel like there's enough awareness that if we just presented their metadata back to them in a way that said this is this is this is what your entry in Google Scholar will look like, for instance. Like, yeah. will, will people look at that and say, okay, I see there's a problem, or is, is the awareness not quite there? I think it probably depends on the person. There are probably lots of people who would just go, yeah, 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 yeah. And they would click through it. But I, I think that would help. Yeah, generating the citation right away. This is how this will look in the citations you've elected as being the most important 
citation styles for you, and they'll automatically know when they see it that that's problematic. Um, and, and I think already we're doing this by allowing people in, in three to potentially omit certain metadata fields. I think we just need more metadata fields. We don't have a corporate name uh, field, for example. We should have one so that people don't shoehorn those into people names. Um, but yeah, I think that would go a long way. Rosario, given that what Mike just said about feedback, and you have actually done some usability study on editorial process, do you feel, did you get a sense from your work that that sort of live feedback would be part of, an, part of that professionalization process, part of the training and help? Yes. I think uh, not only in Mexico, I think in, in uh, think in whole Latin America, we need uh, feedback because uh, there are a lot of uh, people that are trying to help uh, editors to uh, install the OGS, but d nobody knows how really does it work. And uh, you know, all, all the editors are people who are uh, uh, academics who are working and they have their their own work and besides that they need to start to learn all these uh, ten technique stuff and it's a little bit difficult for all of us yes um, I wanted to, I wanted to thank you very much for your talk because it addressed exactly the problem that I came here to solve on our own pro on our own journal um, and as I was thinking, I thought of that for us, this is the solution, and I think this is worth considering for others too. Um, the solution is the fact that the editors um, are, as you say, self-taught. They're not only self-taught, they're also, they were, they were self-taught self in an age before metadata. Um, and they're often not even aware that there is such a thing as metadata. And um, I would think that in, in our case, undoubtedly, um, I can surely get, uh, the, the person who would be correctly trained will be our editorial assistant who is uh, doing her doctorate now and will, be, is, will in a very short time be able to do all of this matter perfectly well and she can keep the editor who is of course a very, a very senior uh, researcher who is also not, has, has no interest now in building up his name in the field, he's already, he's already famous, he doesn't need it at all. And I think this would be useful for many other people as a way to get, um, to have the younger generation as it were train the older generation. Yes, I think this is uh, probably one uh, of uh, the way to, s to solve this situation, that um, uh, all the editorial teams start to add uh, younger people uh, people who knows how this all these uh, technological uh, issues function, and I think it's the, the only way. But the, the main trouble is that uh, uh, all the universities uh, uh, don't have uh, uh, jobs for them. Then it's a big trouble. We do have time for like, yep, one more question. My question is about ORCID again. Like some funders now start to started to require ORCIDs. Um, for instance, the Austrian Science Foundation, FWF, has now a new requirement to include ORCID IDs for every project application if you want to apply for funding, which resulted in some maybe unintended, but maybe not that surprising consequence that there are now many ORCID records with no public information visible with only name and the last name, but nothing else, which barely helps if you would like to distinguish persons or the, uh, attribute their work and so on. So my question is, um, do you have some measures or policies or incentives? How could you incentivize to share information if person then has an ORCID ID? Great question. That's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, this is really high on our list of priorities. We can't force people to add information to their ORCID record, but what we do want to do is to encourage them, strongly encourage them to do so by showing them the value that it adds for them. Um, so from my perspective in particular, I think you know, public information is great if they're happy to share it. There's also an option for limited access information, which means that you share it 
um, on request, basically, with organisations that want to access it. Those would be ORCID member organisations. And then there's a private option, which I think we should really be, as much as possible, steering people away from using, because the limited access really does the job of the private. You don't have to share that information. You choose on a case-by-case -case basis whether you want to share it and what you want to share. So I would like, I mean, we, we're not going to discontinue private, but I would like um, to see less use of the private information and more use of the limited and public. And we have a, um, uh, a sort of orchid curriculum that we're going to be rolling out this fall. And one of the elements of that is going to be really starting to try and encourage um, researchers to, to, to better understand why it's good for them as well as for their organisations and the community to connect information or even better to have their organizations connect information to their records so in the case of the funders what we're trying to do with them is if any organization is going to require ORCID we want the sort of the the flip side of that to be well there's a benefit in it for the research which is you have to give me your ORCID ID and in return I'm going to connect information about your award or your publication or your your affiliation to your ORCID record and keep that updated so it's one less thing for you to worry about so that, that's a, um, a big part of the sort of the curriculum that we're rolling out in a couple of months' time. And as and when that happens, I'd be really interested in your in your feedback on it. All right. Well, I'd like to give one big round of applause for our speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>